on to the next chapter of my retro gaming adventure. Thanks for joining me. Ah, tennis. This is one of the very early launch titles for the Famicom, which you can see from its 1983 date on the title screen. As such, you wouldn't expect it to be much of a classic, and you wouldn't be wrong. I actually played this heaps back when Nintendo games were a new novelty. You can laugh now, but when you were used to video games looking like this, and then compared it to this, it was amazing. As you can see from the instruction book here, there's actually a fair few different styles of swing you can take in this game, which is pretty impressive for its time. This was, of course, before many, many more different and better tennis games were released. With games that are trying to simulate real life, there's no way old games like this can stand up to today's alternatives. It's cute for retro's sake, but it's pretty clunky. I'm afraid this one falls. Pinball is one of the most simplistic Nintendo games. It is, surprise surprise, based on a custom made pinball table. You press the D-pad for the left bumper and either the A or the B button for the right bumper. That's it. The rest is up to gravity and luck. It's very shallow. And yet, I still find this game somewhat irresistible. There are only two screens in this entire game. Well, three if you count the bonus level. That's where Mario tries to save Pauline by catching her on his platform. With the speed of the ball, this is actually trickier than you might think. Being that it's pinball, so much of this game is down to dumb luck. But it's still fun if you can get past the fact that sometimes you'll lose a life through absolutely no fault of your own. It's not going to hold anyone's interest for very long, but from my point of view, I'd say pinball stands the test of time. Next we have Kid Icarus. Oh, Kid Icarus. I want to love this game. I've wanted to love it for decades, but it drives me bonkers. The concepts and the setting are great. Who doesn't love a bit of Greek mythology? Oh, I mean in a family-friendly, cartoony kind of way. <clears throat> Coward! I can't wait to see what they do with the characters and the story in the upcoming 3DS game. This game though, the original, it's just so flawed, it borders on being completely inaccessible. For starters, the first few levels scroll up, which, well, hey, points for originality, not many other platform games scroll up, but if you happen to fall down a bottomless pit, you are done for. Pit, ironically, is the name of the lead character, and those angel wings clearly aren't effective enough to save him from dying when he falls into a... pit. You can get an upgrade that will fly you back up, but it will cost you. This plucky little angel is also pretty unstable on his feet. Every time he lands from a jump, he takes a couple of steps before coming to a stop, which makes for some really annoying platforming. There's 13 levels in all, and levels 4, 8, and 12 are mazes. This is a cool design, and it really breaks the levels up and adds some variety. The game suddenly takes on a Zelda-like exploratory tone. You need to watch out for the rotten stuff. Stinking eggplant wizards though, if they manage to toss an eggplant onto your head, you're helpless until you can find the room to get it removed. The whole eggplant thing comes across as ultra trolling and it does not make the game any more fun. If you have the patience and stamina to make it past World 1, World 2 opens up and the game suddenly becomes a much more conventional run and gun platformer. World 3 goes vertical again, and World 4 is one big horizontal flying level. On its original Famicom Disk System release, this was one of the earliest games to allow you to save because the discs could be written to. In its Western release though, we had to make do with ridiculously long passwords. The good thing is though, you can use the passwords to take you to parts of the game that you'd never have the patience to reach normally. <laughs> one thing that Kid Icarus does have going for it is a great soundtrack, especially for such an early game. The music in this is really good. It's got some very memorable tunes. Overall, apart from some great concepts, the frustration outweighs the decency in this game. It's just not as fun as it should be, and I'm afraid this is another game that falls. I feel like there's a reasonably good game in here, it's just stuck behind a wall of irritation. And finally, we're at the first Nintendo game I ever played, the one that every gamer has played, or should have played, Super Mario Brothers. 
there's nothing I can say here that hasn't been said so many times before, especially compared to the other games around the same era, Mario is a work of genius. Sure, the controls are nowhere near as refined as they became in subsequent games, but everything just works well, and if you find yourself dying, you know that it's your fault, not the game's. After playing early platform games like Kid Icarus and Ice Climber, it's so obvious when playing Mario what a revelation the jumping mechanics were. At the time, of course, we all just took Mario's jumping for granted. We knew it felt great, but we didn't give much thought as to why. Miyamoto and his team worked tirelessly to get the arc of the jump just right and designed every level around Mario's capacity to jump. His original name was Jumpman, after all. But there's so much more that this game introduced. Who can forget the thrill of discovering a warp zone? Or a beanstalk that would take you up into the clouds, Jack and the Beanstalk style. And knowing that Mario and Luigi are plumbers, of course they're going to be able to go down into the sewers. Who would have thought that plumbers would be so good at holding their breath underwater though? Every time Mario makes it to the end of a castle and faces off against Bowser, or, or a clone of Bowser anyway until the very last boss, He's greeted with a toad who tells him that he's come to the wrong place and the princess is in another castle. You rotten, stinking little boy. While playing Super Mario Bros. this year, I wanted to try out an old urban legend that I'd heard about on so many occasions, the Minus World. Legend says that if you go to the end of level 1-2 and do this weird crouching jump into the wall, you'd send the game into some kind of glitch mode. After many failed attempts, I finally managed to do it. I went through the pipe and found myself in the famous glitch world, minus one. Although it's cool to make it happen, the actual reality of the minus world is a bit disappointing. All it really does is takes you to an endlessly looping version of level 7-2. Apparently in the Japanese Famicom version, World Minus One was bonkers crazy with glitchy stuff everywhere, but in the NES version this is all we get. Oh well. In retrospect, playing the original Super Mario Bros. is not going to give you the variety that future games would give, and yeah, when placed alongside its brethren, the game isn't as tightly controlling or as wildly imaginative. But, being that it was such a mind-blowing pioneer of the genre, how amazing is it that it's still really fun to play, warts and all? Everybody needs to play this game. It was the birth of modern gaming, and it stands the test of time. Next week is an absolute classic, and I can't wait to get back into it. The Legend of Zelda. See you then. Peace out.